Eros and Civilization, a Philosophical Inquiry into Freud by Herbert Marcuse. This is Chapter 1, The Hidden Trend in Psychoanalysis. The concept of man that emerges from Freudian theory is the most irrefutable indictment of Western civilization, and at the same time the most unshakable defense of this civilization. According to Freud, the history of man is the history of his repression. Culture constraints not only his or hold on culture constrains not only his societal but also his biological existence, not only parts of the human being, but his instinctual structure itself. However, such constraint is the very precondition of progress. Left free to pursue their natural objectives, the basic instincts of man would be incompatible with all lasting association and preservation. They would destroy even where they unite. The uncontrolled Eros is just as fatal as his deadly counterpart, the death instinct. Their destructive force derives from the fact that they strive for a gratification which culture cannot grant. Gratification as such and as an end in itself at any moment. The instincts must therefore be deflected from their goal, inhibited in their aim. Civilization begins when the primary objective, namely integral satisfaction of needs, is effectively renounced. The, vicissi the vicissitudes of the instincts are the vicissitudes of the mental apparatus in civilization. The animal drives become human instincts under the influence of the external reality. Their original location in the organism and their basic direction remain the same but their objectives and their manifestations are subject to change. All psychoanalytic concepts, sublimation, identification, projection, repression, introjection, connote the mutability of the instincts. But the reality which shapes the instincts as well as their needs and satisfaction is a socio-historical world. The animal man becomes a human being only through fundamental transformation of his nature affecting not only the instinctual aims, but also the instinctual values, that is, the principles that govern the attainment of the aims. The change in the governing value system may be tentatively defined as follows. From immediate satisfaction to delayed satisfaction, from pleasure to restraint of pleasure, from joy or play to toil, work from receptiveness to productiveness, from absence of repression to security. Freud described this change as the transformation of the pleasure principle into the reality principle. The interpretation of the mental apparatus in terms of these two principles is basic to Freud's theory and remains so in spite of all modifications of the dualistic conception. It corresponds largely, but not entirely, to the distinction between unconscious and conscious processes. The individual exists, as it were, in two different dimensions, characterized by different mental processes and principles. The difference between these two dimensions is a genetic, historical, as well as a structural one. The unconscious, ruled by the pleasure principle, comprises the older primary processes the residues of a phase of development in which they were the only kind of mental processes. They strive for nothing but for gaining pleasure from any operation which might arouse unpleasantness, pain, mental activity draws back. <coughs> but the unrestrained pleasure principle comes into conflict with the natural and human environment. The individual comes to the traumatic realization that full and painless gratification of his needs is impossible. And after this experience of disappointment, a new principle of mental functioning gains ascendancy. The reality principle supersedes the pleasure principle. Man learns to give up momentary, uncertain, and destructive pleasure for delayed, restrained, but assured pleasure. Because of this lasting gain through an through renunciation and restraint, according to Freud, the reality principle safeguards rather than dethrones, modifies rather than denies the pleasure principle.
However, the psychoanalytic interpretation reveals that the reality principle enforces a change not only in the form and timing of pleasure, but in its very substance. The adjustment of pleasure to the reality principle implies the subjugation and diversion of the destructive force of instinctual gratification of its incompatibility with the established societal norms and relations, and, by that token, implies the transubstantiation of pleasure itself. With the establishment of the reality principle, the human being which, under the pleasure principle, has been hardly more than a bundle of animal drives, has become an organized ego. It strives for what is useful and what can be obtained without damage to itself and to its vital environment. Under the reality principle, the human being develops the function of reason. It learns to test the reality, to distinguish between good and bad, true and false, useful and harmful. Man acquires the faculties of attention, memory, and, and judgment. He becomes a conscious, thinking subject, geared to a rationality which is imposed upon him from outside. Only one mode of thought activity is split off from the new organization of the mental apparatus and remains free from the rule of the reality principle. Fantasy is protected from cultural alterations and stays committed to the pleasure principle. Otherwise, the mental apparatus is effectively subordinated to the reality principle. The function of motor discharge, which under the supremacy of the pleasure principle, had served an un or had served to unburden the mental apparatus of accretions of stimuli is now employed in the appropriate alteration of reality. It is converted into action. The scope of man's desires and the instrumentalities for their gratification are thus immeasurably increased and his ability to alter reality consciously in accordance with what is useful seems to promise a gradual removal of extraneous barriers to his gratification. However, neither his desires nor his alteration of reality are henceforth his own. They are now organized by his society. And this organization represses and trans transubstantiates his original instinctual needs. If absence from repression is the archetype of freedom, then civilization is the struggle against this freedom. The replacement of the pleasure principle by the reality principle is the great traumatic event in the development of man, in the development of the genus, as well as of the individual. According to Freud, this event is not unique, but recurs throughout the history of mankind and of every individual. Phylogenetically, it occurs first in the primal horde, when the primal father monopolizes power and pleasure and enforces renunciation on the part of the sons. Ontogenetically, it occurs during the period of early childhood and, sub sub and submission to the reality principle is enforced by the parents and other educators. But both on the generic and on the individual level, submission is continuously reproduced the rule of the primal father is followed. After the first rebellion by the rule of the sons and the brother clan develops instu into institutionalized social and political domination. The reality principle materializes in a system of institutions and the individual growing up within such a system learns the requirements of the reality principle as those of law and order and transmits them to the next generation. The fact that the reality principle has to be re-established continually in the development of man indicates that its triumph over the pleasure principle is never complete and never secure. In the Freudian conception, civilization does not once and for all terminate a state of nature. What civilization masters and represses, the claim of the pleasure principle, continues to exist in civilization itself. The unconscious retains the objectives of the defeated pleasure principle. Turned back by the external reality or even unable to reach it, the full force of the pleasure principle not only survives in the unconscious, but also affects in manifold ways the very reality which has superseded the pleasure principle. 
The return of the repressed makes up the tabooed and subterranean history of civilization. And the exploration of this history reveals not only the secret of the individual, but also that of civilization. Freud's individual psychology is in its very essence social psychology. Repression is a historical phenomenon. The effective subjugation of the instincts to repressive controls is imposed not by nature, but by man. The primal father, as the archetype of domination, initiates the chain reaction of enslavement, rebellion, and reinforced domination, which marks the history of civilization. But ever since the first prehistoric restoration of domination following the first rebellion, repression from without has been supported by repression from within. The unfree individual interjects his masters and their commands into his own mental apparatus. The struggle against freedom reproduces itself in the psyche of man as the self-repression of the repressed individual and his self-repression in turn sustains his masters and their institutions. It is this mental dynamic which Freud unfolds as the dynamic of civilization. According to Freud, the repressive modification of the instincts under the reality principle is enforced and sustained by the eternal primordial struggle for existence, persisting to the present day. Scarcity teaches men that they cannot freely gratify their instinctual impulses, that they cannot live under the pleasure principle. Society's motive in enforcing the decisive modification of the instinctual structure is thus, economic since it has not means enough to support life for its members without work on their part. It must see to it that the number of these members is restricted and their energy is directed away from sexual activities onto their work. This conception is as old as civilization and has always provided the most effective rationalization for repression. To a considerable extent, Freud's theory partakes of this rationalization. Freud considers the primordial struggle for existence as eternal and therefore believes that the pleasure principle and the reality principle are eternally antagonistic. The notion that a non-repressive civilization is impossible is a cornerstone cornerstone of Freudian theory. However, his theory contains elements that break through this rationalization. They shatter the predominant tradition of Western thought and even suggest its reversal. His work is characterized by an, by an uncompromising insistence on showing up the repressive content of the highest values and achievements of culture. Insofar as he does this, he denies the equation of reason with repression on which the ideology of culture is built. Freud's metapsychology is an ever-renewed attempt to uncover and to question the terrible necessity of the interconnection between civilization and barbarism, progress and suffering, freedom and unhappiness, a connection which reveals itself ultimately as that between Eros and Thanatos. Freud questions culture not from a romanticist or utopian point of view, but on the ground of the suffering and misery which its implementation involves. Cultural freedom thus appears in the light of unfreedom, and cultural progress in the light of constraint. Culture is not thereby refuted. Unfreedom and constraint are the price that must be paid. But as Freud exposes their scope and their depth, he upholds the tabooed aspirations of humanity, the claim for a state where freedom and necessity coincide. Whatever liberty exists in the realm of the developed consciousness and in the world it is created, is only derivative, compromised freedom, gained at the expense of the full satisfaction of needs. And insofar as the full satisfaction of, satisfaction of needs is happiness, freedom in civilization is essentially antagonistic to happiness. It involves the repressive modification, sublimation of happiness. Conversely, the unconscious, the deepest and oldest layer of the mental personality, is the drive for integral gratification, which is absence of want and repression. As such, it is the immediate identity of necessity and freedom. According to Freud's conception, the equation of freedom and happiness tabooed by the conscious is upheld by the unconscious. Its truth, although repelled by consciousness, 
continues to haunt the mind. It preserves the memory of past stages of individual development at which integral gratification is obtained. And the past continues to claim the future. It generates the wish that the paradise be recreated on the basis of the achievements of civilization. If memory moves into the center of psychoanalysis as a decisive mode of cognition, this is far more than a therapeutic device. The therapeutic role of memory derives from the truth value of memory. Its truth value lies in the specific function of memory to preserve promises and potentialities which are betray betrayed and even outlawed by the mature, civilized individual, but which had once been fulfilled in his dim past and which are never entirely forgotten. The reality principle restrains the cognitive function of memory, its commitment to the past, experience of happiness, which spurns the desire for its, for its conscious recreation. The psychoanalytic liberation of memory explodes the rationality of the repressed individual. As cognition gives way to recognition, the forbidden images and impulses of childhood begin to tell the truth that reason denies. Regression assumes a progressive function. The rediscovered past yields critical standards which are tabooed by the present. Moreover, the restoration of memory is accompanied by the restoration of the cognitive content of fantasy. Psychoanalytic theory removes these mental faculties from the noncommittal sphere of daydreaming and fiction and recaptures their strict truths. The weight of these discoveries must eventually shatter the framework in which they were made and confined. The liberation of the past does not end in its reconciliation with the present. Against the self-imposed restraint of the discoverer, or a discoverer, the orientation on the past tends toward an orientation on the future. The Recherche du Temps Perdu becomes the vehicle of future liberation. The subsequent discussion will be focused on this hidden trend in psychoanalysis. Freud's analysis of the development of the repressive mental apparatus proceeds on two levels. A. Ontogenetic the growth of the repressed individual from early infancy to his conscious societal existence, and b. Phylogenetic, the growth of repressive civilization from the primal horde to the fully constituted civilized state. The two levels are continually interrelated. This interrelation is epitomized in Freud's notion of the return of the repressed in history. The individual re-experiences and reenacts the great traumatic, traumatic events in the development of the genus, and the instinctual dynamic reflects throughout the conflict between individual and genus, between particular and universal, as well as the various solutions of this conflict. We shall first follow the ontogenetic development to the mature state of the civilized individual. We shall then return to the phylogenetic origins and extend the Freudian conception to the mature state of the civilized genus. The constant interrelation between the two levels means that recurrent cross-references, anticipations, and repetitions are unavoidable.